Hello, and welcome to your Microbiology Bio 203 lecture video on control of microbial growth. I am Mr. Kennedy, and I will take you through this exploration of factors that regulate or control microbial growth. The first thing that we're going to do today is to take a few minutes just to define some basic terminology associated with microbial growth control. The first is sepsis. Sepsis refers to bacterial contamination, while asepsis is the absence of significant contamination. Aseptic surgery requires the prevention of microbial contamination. So the idea is to take as many steps as possible to eliminate microorganisms in a sepsis. Sterilization is the removal and destroying of all microbial life. Commercial sterilization sets the standard high enough to kill Clostridium botulinum endospores and remove them from canned food items. Commercial sterilization, setting a standard this high, virtually guarantees that all other life forms will be killed along with the highly resistant endospores from Clostridium botulinum. Disinfection destroys harmful microorganisms. Antisepsis destroys harmful microorganisms from living tissue. Degerming. Degerming is the mechanical removal of microbes from a limited area. While sanitization lowers the microbial counts on eating utensils to safe levels. Biocides or germicides are the chemicals that we use to treat and kill microbes, while bacteriostasis is not about killing, but instead inhibiting microbial growth. The rate of microbial death. The rate of microbial death is something that we can easily graph and predict the same way we can easily graph and predict microbial growth. Using a table such as this, we can calculate what's called the decimal reduction time, or the rate at which microorganisms will die as they go through generations of death that are similar to generations of growth. In terms of a decimal reduction time, the idea is that 90% of whatever number of organisms you start with dies in each time interval, leaving only 10% behind. You'll be asked to make calculations using this concept on tests. Understand that if you are making these calculations and you end up with even a single survivor as pictured here on this table, you are not done. You must kill all cells to guarantee that no cells will return. The effectiveness of treatment in controlling microbial growth depends on the number of microbes you start with, the environment, organic matter, temperature, or biofilm, the time of exposure, and other microbial characteristics. Do they have a capsule, slime coat of some sort that protects them? The actions of microbial control agents. In this section, you want to pay close attention to what to use, when, and on what. Actions of microbial control agents can alter membrane permeability, damage proteins or enzymes in the cells, or damage nucleic acids. Each has its own set of pros and cons. First, we'll look at heat. Heat denatures enzymes. As we denature enzymes, we have two points in time that we have to consider, the thermal death point and the thermal death time. The thermal death point is the lowest temperature at which all cells in the liquid culture are killed in 10 minutes. The thermal death time is the minimal time for all bacteria in a liquid to be killed at a particular temperature. Next, let's consider moist heat sterilization. Moist heat denatures proteins. Boiling or using free-flowing steam can create moist heat and is often faster and more effective at sterilizing than dry heat. The autoclave is probably the most effective moist heat sterilization tool we have at our disposal. The autoclave produces steam under pressure, temperatures of 121 degrees Celsius at 15 PSI for 15 minutes can kill all organisms and endospores. However, steam must contact the item's surface. This is how an autoclave works. Again, the only way that it is truly effective is if the steam can actually make contact with the microorganism. So if you look closely at this picture and notice that there is a stopper in the flask inside the autoclave, this would not be an ideal scenario. If that stopper prevents the steam from entering the flask, 
then microorganisms can survive this treatment. Furthermore, the pressure could actually explode the flask. So anytime you put a flask in the autoclave, if there is a stopper, it must be loosened in order to take care of those previous problems. Large containers require longer sterilization times. Sometimes test strips can actually be used to indicate sterility as opposed to just the timer on the autoclave. The effect of container size on autoclave sterilization times is listed in this table for your consideration. Pasteurization. Pasteurization reduces spoilage organisms and pathogens, but does not sterilize solutions. Equivalent treatments in the sterilization process include 63 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes, or a higher temperature short time, AT, HT, ST, 72 degrees Celsius for 15 seconds, or ultra high temperature, UHT, 140 degrees Celsius for 4 seconds. If organisms are thermodiuric, they can survive. Heat sterilization usually kills by oxidation. Heat sterilization includes flaming, incineration, or simple hot air sterilization. Filtration. Filtration is the passage of a substance through a screen-like material. This is used for heat-sensitive materials. In the event that you cannot boil, flame, or otherwise use steam to clean an object, sometimes filtration is a viable alternative. High-efficiency particulate air filters remove microbes of sizes greater than 0.3 micrometers. Membrane filters can remove microbes of sizes greater than 0.22 micrometers. This is the filtration process. It is most effective for liquids or air. There are some other physical methods of microbial control. Low temperature has a bacteriostatic effect. Refrigeration, deep freezing, and lyophilization mentioned in our previous video are actually ways of controlling microbial growth. High pressure denatures proteins. Desiccation or the removal of water can prevent metabolism and prohibit microbial growth. Osmotic pressure using salt and sugar to create a hypertonic environment can cause plasmolysis. Radiation is also an effective microbial growth inhibitor. Ionizing radiation such as x-rays, gamma rays, and electron beams ionize water to create reactive hydroxyl radicals. This damages DNA, causing lethal mutations. Non-ionizing radiation, such as UV at 206 nanometer wavelengths, can damage DNA by creating thymine dimers. Microwaves are also a form of radiation. They kill by heat. They are not especially antimicrobial, as they simply boil water. This picture is meant to give you an illustration of the levels of radiation outside of the visible light spectrum. The visible light spectrum exists from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometer wavelengths. Above the 400 nanometer wavelength is where we find radiation. Chemical methods of microbial control. The principles of effective disin disinfection include the concentration of disinfectant, organic matter, pH, and time. We'll use disk dilution tests to determine the exact concentration of chemicals necessary to achieve the desired effect. Metal cylinders can be dipped in test bacteria and dried. The cylinders are placed in a disinfectant for 10 minutes at 20 degrees Celsius. The cylinders can then be transferred to culture media to determine whether the bacteria survive the treatment. In the disk diffusion method, again, we evaluate the efficacy of chemical agents by applying the chemical agent to a paper disk and then putting that paper disc in our inoculum and looking for a zone of inhibition. This is an illustration of what such an experiment might look like. The larger the zone of inhibition, the more effective the disinfectant. Here's a list of different types of chemical disinfectants and what they might accomplish for you. Phenol and phenolics injure lipids of plasma membranes causing leakage. Bisphenols contain two phenyl groups connected by a bridge. Hexachlorophene and triclosan disrupt 
plasma membranes. Thygonides, like chlorhexidine, are used in surgical hand scrubs and again disrupt plasma membranes. Halogens, like iodine and chlorine, um, impair protein synthesis and alter membranes. Alcohols denature proteins and dissolve lipids. They have no effect on endospores and non-enveloped viruses. Heavy metals. Heavy metals and their components have oligodynamic action, which, in very small amounts, exert antimicrobial activity by denaturing proteins. Things like silver nitrate are used to prevent ophthalmia. Muric uh, chloride prevents mildew. Copper sulfate is an algicide, and zinc chloride can be found in mouthwash. Surface active agents include things like soap, um, acid, anonic, sanitizers, and quaternary ammonia, or quats. Soap is a de-germing and emulsification agent. The acid anionic sanitizers, well, their anions react with plasma membranes, and quaternary ammonia cations are bacterial cycle denaturing proteins. Next, we'll look at the clinical focus and application of chemical food preservatives. Chemical food preservatives, such as sulfur dioxide, prevent things like wine from spoiling. Organic acids inhibit metabolism. Sorbic acid, benzoic acid, calcium propanate prevent molds in acidic foods. Nitrates um, prevent endospore germination. These are all things that you can look for on the labels of products in your own home. Antibiotics. Antibiotics, as their name implies, kill microorganisms. They are bacteriocidin, basically proteins produced by one bacteria that inhibits another. Nissen and natamycin prevent the spoilage of cheese. The aldehydes. These are inactive proteins. Um, they inactivate proteins by cross-linking with functional groups in the amine, the hydroxyl, carboxyl, and sulfohydryl groups. They're used to preserve specimens in medical equipment. Formaldehyde is an excellent example. Chemical sterilants include gaseous, gaseous sterilants. Gaseous sterilants cause alkylation, replacing hydrogen atoms of a chemical group with a free radical. Cross-linked nucleic acids and proteins, and they can be used for heat-sensitive materials. An example of a good chemical sterilant is ethylene oxide. Plasma is the fourth state of matter consisting of electrically excited gas. This is used to sterilize tubular instruments because its free radicals destroy microbes. Supercritical fluids are used for medical implants. Carbon dioxide, which has both gaseous and liquid properties, can be used for this purpose. Perioxygens and other forms of oxygen are good oxidizing agents. They are used for contaminated surfaces and food packaging. This concludes this lecture on microbial growth control.